wireless companies are making billions of dollars from their customers, and they have been telling the public that they would keep them safe from RF radiation as required by the Telecommunications Act of 1996 for several years. These same wireless companies should be paying their fair share of revenue in fines if they are in fact breaking the law and failing to protect workers and the public from exposure to unlawful and harmful radiation levels, shouldn't they? In Part 1, we surveyed a site in Queens, New York that received an FCC notice of violation. The rooftop has multiple access points to the roof, allowing any member of the general public access to it. Exactly how do we notify the FCC that this dangerous condition still exists? Filing a complaint about a suspected violation should be a matter of a few mouse clicks on the FCC website, shouldn't it? Unfortunately, it looks like the FCC forgot to put a selection for filing radio frequency radiation exposure complaints on the complaint section of their website. Since there is no form to fill out, we called the FCC phone number and left a very specific and detailed complaint about our site and sent a detailed email to. But the only response we got was a generic handout about wireless devices that had absolutely nothing to do with our detailed complaint. So even though the Enforcement Bureau's mission statement says that their mission is to investigate potential unlawful conduct to ensure strict compliance with public safety related rules, there is virtually no mechanism in place to file a complaint about any potential RF radiation exposure violations, whether they've already had a notice of violation issued against a license holder or not. We sent a very formal complaint to the FCC's Enforcement Bureau Chief and carbon copied many of the elected government officials that may have a responsibility to protect their constituents. Surely this would get the FCC to investigate if unlawful conduct is continuing to occur at a site that has already received a notice of violation. That complaint was sent on December 9, 2011. It is now March 2013. We still have not received a formal response on the status of that complaint from the FCC or any of these elected officials. With hundreds of thousands of licensed sites deployed nationwide, we suspected that this first complaint represented the tip of the iceberg. After an extensive database search, we started investigating other sites to determine exactly how widespread the problem is. The mounting structures for these antennas seem to be a prevalent source of roof leaks that requires perpetual maintenance, inspections, and worker RF radiation exposure. These antenna mounts may be near rooftop edges in many instances, but persons trained to work near the rooftop edge can spend a considerable amount of time in these dangerous exposure areas. OSHA has even exempted inspectors from wearing fall protection while making inspections in these areas. By allowing the wireless carriers to self-report that their sites are compliant with federal law, they have been allowed to create the illusion or facade that they are complying with the regulations. We have found many signs at the sites that we have visited. Unfortunately, none of these signs provided guidance to protect workers and the public from harmful radiation exposure or supply the specific information required to allow a trained worker to control their exposure. None of the carrier supplied phone numbers we've contacted have ever supplied helpful, meaningful safety advice in a timely fashion. We've even recorded these conversations from wireless carriers and delivered them to the FCC several months ago to be sure that they know that safety guidance from the wireless carriers is nearly unobtainable. Even worse, every landlord or facility maintenance worker that we spoke to had no idea what RF radiation exposure risks existed at the property that they managed or maintained. We have documented hundreds of sites that exceed the lawful exposure limit and we have sent hundreds of formal complaints to the FCC Enforcement Bureau. Finally, a person at the FCC Office of Engineering and Technology contacted us about one of these complaints. It was obvious to us that his job was to persuade anyone that managed to get to this gatekeeper to drop their complaint. When the gatekeeper was sent pictures of the site with our NARD measurements, he finally forwarded the complaint to the Enforcement Bureau. He actually expected John Q. Public to provide measurements utilizing very expensive test equipment 
before he would even consider forwarding the complaint to the Enforcement Bureau. There's no telling how many other valid complaints have been turned away by this gatekeeper. Receiving written communications from the FCC was extremely rare, almost like they were intentionally avoiding any written paper trail of our complaint history. We have received a few phone calls, but the conversations were a little condescending, often challenging our methods and the accuracy of our equipment. Our conversations were followed up with written correspondence, but never replied to in writing. Three of our complaints in the state of Missouri were carbon copied to the Senator Claire McCaskill. Senator McCaskill was one of the few elected officials to follow up on her complaints concerning her constituents' safety. She was kind enough to provide us with the letter sent to her from the FCC. The letter states, The Enforcement Bureau is always concerned about public health and safety and takes allegations of violations of our radio frequency exposure limits very seriously. Unfortunately, it's nearly impossible to file a complaint with the FCC. The FCC admitted getting our complaints and claimed all three sites were restricted areas and were properly marked with warning signs consistent with the Commission rules. We've reviewed these rules carefully. Posting nebulous signs without knowledge and control information seems to be a violation as far as we can tell. Our research discovered an FCC NAL that fined a broadcaster for exposing building engineers to RF exposure levels above the FCC public limit on a very restricted rooftop. These building engineers lacked knowledge and control. The FCC also promised that the radio frequency levels were well below the occupational limits. Exactly how far below the occupational limits? Why aren't the specific levels given? What about the FCC public limit? They avoided mentioning that limit completely. We've already determined that workers without knowledge or training cannot be exposed to greater than the FCC public limit without breaking the Commission's rules. It appears that Mr. Karowitz is misquoting Commission rules. Is it possible that the Honorable Claire McCaskill, who is doing her job to protect her constituents from harmful RF radiation, was deceived by carefully crafted double talk? The Senator did what she thought was best and trusted the FCC to protect her constituents. Did she misplace that trust? Well, let's find out. It is possible that we're misinterpreting the Commission rules. While Jerry Olsick of the FCC Enforcement Bureau circulated a presentation back in 2005, let's see how Jerry interprets the rules. Jerry says, For workers to access areas that exceed the public limits, knowledge and control must be given. The Enforcement Bureau agent investigating the Missouri sites must have found that Senator McCaskill's constituents had all of these things to be able to access the site and not have a violation of those commission rules. Jerry keeps repeating knowledge and control. It must be an important part of the commission rules. Funny thing about this 2005 presentation though, how can the FCC show so many non-compliant wireless sites but there isn't a notice of violation to accompany any of the offending parties in these slides. I would challenge the FCC to prove what action was taken against the non-compliant sites in Jerry's slides. Rest assured, the Enforcement Bureau is always concerned about public health and safety. They are apparently helpless to do anything about it, though. We keep hearing that our measurement accuracy is suspect. Is it possible that our equipment calibrated by NARDA is not accurate? We took these concerns to NARDA. They suggested comparing our old meter to the results of a newer meter. The newer generation of measurement equipment is too expensive for our small budget. However, NARDA suggested renting this equipment from an equipment rental firm. NARDA claims this is the same updated equipment used by the FCC. We returned to site EMR 014 in July of 2012 after the FCC's visit in March. We asked our escorts to the roof if they ever had RF safety training or if they were aware of an RF safety plan for the roof. They told us there was not. The newspaper proves that we were there after the FCC visit. We placed a 20 centimeter marker at the 6 foot level of each antenna that we measured. Some of the antennas had plastic chain and barriers scattered about, and some had none. Using the string as a guide, a 6 foot spatial average was performed for each antenna using both meters. We attempted to videotape all of the measurements, 
but the RF interference was so strong it kept disabling the video camera. Our new meter measured 464% of the FCC public limit, and our old meter measured 423% of the FCC's public limit. Barely below the occupational limit, but far above the public limit. Without knowledge and control, this site is in violation of the Commission rules for exposure. More importantly, these two meters correlate within NARDA's advertised specifications and further validates that our old meter is performing properly. The 230 building is complaint EMR 013 in Missouri. Derek is responsible for maintaining the building. Let's ask him if he has knowledge and control. Hello. Uh, Derek. Yeah. Hey, Derek, this is John. Uh, I represent the EMR Policy Institute and uh, we're advocates of worker safety in RF radiation environments. Uh -huh. Hey, uh, are you aware that areas on uh, the rooftop over at the 230 building uh, exceed the federal radiation limits? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, well, the antennas, the antennas on your rooftop over there, Yeah. they, uh, they transmit RF radiation. Yeah. And there's guidelines set up by the FCC and the government so that people don't get overexposed to these uh, these types of radiation. Okay. Have you ever had any training? Have you ever had any training or guidance or anything about uh, where to be around those antennas by AT&T? No, not really, no. Okay. All right, well, how about the FCC? Have they ever Have they ever talked to you or anything like that? No, never. No. Yeah. Well, we. No, well, we they, they told us that they were up there doing an investigation, but right. We never talked to them about it. No. T-Mobile has absolutely no signs, chains, or even kite string around their antennas. They also exceed the FCC public and FCC occupational limits in front of these antennas. No knowledge. No control. Where are the warning signs that Mr. Karowitz assured Senator McCaskill? We're in place providing knowledge and control to protect Derek from RF radiation, exceeding the FCC occupational limit. We did report the findings of our return visits to these Missouri sites to the FCC and Senator McCaskill. What was the FCC's reply? We don't know, since they will not officially respond to any of our complaints. Our first complaint was filed directly to the FCC Enforcement Bureau Chief 16 months ago and we have filed more than a hundred complaints to her since. How much longer will the FCC allow a dangerous RF exposure condition to exist in this Queen's neighborhood? How much longer will Derek have to work in a dangerous RF environment exceeding the FCC occupational exposure limit with no knowledge or training to help him control his exposure? How many hundreds of thousands of citizens have to question if their workplace or homes are safe from RF radiation exposure when we cannot get the FCC to competently enforce Commission rules on one single site in 16 months. Is there collusion between the FCC and the wireless industry to turn a blind eye to violations? Is there a cover-up? Is the FCC's promotion of wireless technology compromising its ability to police the technology? Should the FCC's regulatory compliance authority be delegated to the EPA or another jurisdiction? These are some areas of inquiry Congress should pursue when questioning FCC Chairman Janikowski and Enforcement Chief Ellison. If you live or work in hazardous areas like the ones we've shown you in this video, you owe it to yourself, your workmates, your friends, and your family to ask your elected officials to be sure the wireless companies are held accountable for their actions. And the FCC be held accountable for this. Wireless. Industry. Safety. Failure.